Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Keith Souter. It's my pleasure to be able to facilitate this discussion today. You have um, an order of proceedings in front of you, so you get a feel for the speakers that we will work our way through, and we're looking forward to their responses. As you can see, the emphasis for today's uh, commemoration of this event, which of course is being commemorated all the way around the world, the United Nations General Assembly Resolution, we're looking at issues of innovation and empowerment. And so almost all of the questions, except for the final presenter, everybody's been asked to talk about that context of empowerment and innovation. So I begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land in which we meet, and we pay tribute to the wise stewardship of leaders past, present, and emerging. And we will begin with a question for uh, the Honourable Tanya Davis. Uh, ah, sorry, Ruth. <laughs> um, I might just say that uh, the Honourable Tanya Davis is, has three major portfolios. Uh, so she's Minister for Ageing, Minister for Women and Minister for uh, Mental Health. And it's in that capacity that she'll need to slip away early because she's got still more responsibilities on yet another portfolio. So we're very grateful, Minister, that you're with us today. Let me begin by asking um, Minister Davis, how does the New South Wales Government interpret the word innovation in the context of preventing elder abuse? What a great question. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I think uh, I think innovation is is really about creativity. It's about thinking outside of the box. It's about being open to listening to different ideas, new concepts. And then it's about taking those thoughts and ideas and driving that into reality through a bureaucracy. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yes, Minister. <laughs> yes, Minister, that's right. <laughs> and so I think that, you know, the new, this, this government, the New South Wales Liberals and Nationals government, we've, we've got quite already a long track record of innovation in government. So social benefit bonds, for example, um, the way that we are transforming, embracing um, the digitalisation of engagement with, with governments, you know, digital licences are on their way and service New South Wales centres, you know, a one-stop shop to provide service to our community rather than going to that location for your driver's, driver's licence renewal and this location for your fishing, fishing licence renewal and that location for something else. So we're, we're very much a government wanting to embrace technology and forward thinking. And so when it comes to an, a, a challenging issue such as elder abuse, which, which as we all know is, is largely hidden, it creates, it, it demands of all of us a creativity in how do we tackle that? How do we shine a light? And that's why I want to please commend again the Seniors' Rights Service for how you have developed online toolkits and online education and online videos. And so you have that s service available. And what we are doing as a government, we, we are continuing to, to promote and to fund the Tech Savvy Seniors Program, for example, to, we've, fu we've, we've funded over, is it 60,000 training places? It's some extraordinary number of training places where older people in the community can come for free or for a very small cost and be trained in how to access the internet, how to access online banking and online services. So we, we recognise that there is a, a digital divide between our, our current older population and where services and information are, are, are growing, which is online. And so we're, we're tackling that um, that gap by trying to bridge it. Um, and also I think that the challenge is, you know, as, as a minister in this area, um, you, you need to, to lead, you know, your, your people that work for you and support you. So the bureaucracy, um, the public service, you know, honestly, the people that work for me, they are really dedicated people. They, they are passionate about this area. They want to see change. And so uh, we work together. Um, it's not a I dictate to them, it's a working together. And when you build that mutual respect and you build the vision and the passion, then I think those that may be a little reluctant uh, to, to embrace change, uh, they're kind of either sucked along the change or they find another alternative thing to do with their life. 
mm. their, their choice. But but it's about respecting each other, setting a vision, working together, um, and and not accepting the status quo. Yeah, thank you very much. A second question for you, because it's also again from the government strategy. Um, what else can the New South Wales government do to empower communities, however defined, to prevent elder abuse? So this is the other theme, which is empowerment, Minister. Uh, again, it comes back to, to communicating that there is a problem and, and helping people understand what the problem is and, and that it is a crime uh, and that there is help, help available. So I, I was actually just sitting here watching the videos and, and one of the things that was mentioned about the financial abuse, I thought, I can remember as a young child, my, my aunties going to my grandfather who was a, a refugee from World War II from, from Germany who came out here with nothing and, and built, built his own um, business and supported his family of six children and all the rest. I can remember my aunties going to him and demanding money of him. And I thought to myself, hang on a minute, that was like 30 years ago. This, this issue has been going on for a long time. The challenge is we need to help our communities, our older people, recognise it is wrong behaviour, tell them that there is a way to correct it, there is help available. The issue is how do we communicate that? And I think uh, one thing that we can do better, and I actually have raised it in fact just yesterday in a meeting I was having, I think we can tap into community radio stations. A lot of people from cold backgrounds, multicultural backgrounds, are very much connected through community radio. So I think we can tackle that even more so and more targeted. The messages around what elder abuse is, that it is a crime, and that there are supports available. And this is how you go about it. And we need to tackle community radio um, better, I think. Could you also speak to your colleague, the Minister for Education, see if we can get something in schools? <gasps> Sorry. Yes. So the, the question was, could mm. you speak to your colleague, mm. the Minister for Education, in the hope of getting something into state schools and private schools? Yeah, no, definitely. And, and on that note, uh, one of my passions I brought to this portfolio was to strengthen the intergenerational connectivity, to actually break down the ageist attitudes by, by bridging young people with older people. And I actually asked the department, along with running the standard Grandparents' Day, I wanted them to run a photographic competition that recognises young people's achievement in photography connected with an older person. Again, just another another tranche mm. of, of activity that breaks down ageist attitudes that starts to educate um, people around um, older, older Australians. And, and to that as well, um, I've helped to fund um, a program. Uh, I think it's going to be launched around October uh, and it's about con connecting teenage artists with older centenarians to capture their image, but in the process of doing so, the older person shares their life story. So that's another program that we're funding and we'll be um, announcing very, very soon, the launch of it as well. Good. well it's excellent. about, yeah, tackling ageist attitudes and intergenerational yep. connectivity. Thank you very much indeed, Minister. Excellent. Could I invite you now to hand the microphone over to uh, Robert Critchlow, Superintendent Commander of the Hills Local Area Police Command, um, who's been with the police for 28 years, and often you see him on television as well. We like him on Sunrise, so uh, he's a TV personality as well as being a police officer. Yeah, it's a bad week. I'm on telly. It's always bad news. So, <laughs> so may I put a, yeah, the first question to, the, uh, uh, to, to Rob. What does innovation mean for the New South Wales Police in the context of elder abuse? Thanks, Keith. Uh, thanks, everyone, for having us here, including us in this process. Um, you know, I've been involved in this uh, response work for about six years now. I'm seeing some progress, and it's it's great that we're still part of the picture. And uh, innovation for us is very difficult because uh, we are a monolithic organisation. We are a bureaucracy. We move very slowly and changing, but we are. And I think that um, I often describe uh, abuse of older people, and I don't use the word older abuse, respect for our Indigenous cousins, um, is that Abuse of older people is the third major wave of social dysfunction we're tackling. So we've had uh, the issues of uh, domestic violence, which is all too clear, which we used to handle very poorly as, a, as an organisation, as a government, as a community. 
private business, we don't discuss it. If someone's turned up to work with a black eye, we don't want to talk about it, we don't buy into it. Now I think we've changed that. Uh, child abuse is probably the next one. Where we've had the, the issue of the Royal Commission, which is very, very topical at the moment, of course. Uh, and again, private business, let's not touch it, let's not get involved. Uh, and the third thing is abuse of older people. You know, it's private business, it's between families. Uh, we have uh, familiar issues, we have uh, you know, power relationships, we have uh, issues around language and culture that all tie in together. So from a policing point of view, we're not the best people to be involved in this, really. We're, look, we're looking at the tail end of a lot of dysfunction that's happened over a long period of time, a long continuum of behaviour. Mm -hmm. And sometimes someone suffering abuse as an older person may have been suffering abuse as a newlywed when they are 20, and they're suffering abuse from their children and grandchildren when they're 60s and 70s and 80s. So there's been a lot of opportunities for, for engagement along the way to, to stop that. So for us, innovation's got to be, how do we do things differently because at the moment it's not working. Uh, one of the innovations we're doing personally, and I've, I've spearheaded, uh, is the, the vulnerable community officer, which is, uh, I've got my, my colleague here, Jace. Stand up, Jace. <laughs> there he is. A few living examples of one. We're trying to roll them out wider. Which is um, an innovation in that we're acknowledging that even though we're, we're talking about crime and, and harm to people and, and obvious fraud and, and it's worst case uh, sexual assault and homicide, that uh, there's big tie-ins and crossovers of human services and we can't do this on our own. So. Uh, by the time the person's injured enough or harmed enough or defrauded enough that the police become involved, there's a lot of water under the bridge and a lot of damage done. And the evidence is very clear that any older person suffering any form of abuse is more likely to die sooner than they should. Some uh, studies show there's a 300% increase in mortality from older people suffering any form of abuse. And that includes financial. So one of the issues we have is getting through to people, it's not just the fraud. When an older person's defrauded, they lose confidence in going out, they may suffer a fall, their health declines, uh, they may go into care before they're ready and their, their life lifespans, which should be whatever their body's ready for, is shortened. So it's much more serious than just that. And it's a lot of these issues about how do we tie into human services, what's their best approach. So the Domestic Violence Liaison Officer, which we've had in place for some time now, I think you'll agree is a, is a good institution. It works well. Yeah. Big tie-ins between the human services, big tie-ins of the court, uh, tie-ins of NGOs to provide the best service possible for the, for the um, victims and sufferers of abuse. Um, and uh, the, the joint investigative teams of child abuse uh, cases as well, where we worked hand in hand with, with facts and police and the different agencies to take this holistic approach. Uh, because very rarely are these matters you know, unilaterally looking at all different impacts and comorbidities. You know, the m horrible murder we had last week in my area of a young child, um, police were involved, but there's been a lot to go wrong before it got to us. And really by the time it got to us, it's obviously evidently too late. Um, so that's, that's something we need to engage earlier. We need to enc encourage our frontline responders to really be, be vigilant. And what I find is that the more we speak about it, I speak to my colleagues and, and I speak to fellow commanders, once they're engaged, and I have one of my fellow commanders, Brad Hodder, here today too, who's going to be the Central Metro representative, for example. Once they, they engage in this space and realise the scale of the problem, the number of people suffering, and victimisation of 10% is huge. Like, most people in Sydney will not suffer from a crime. Crime is old. You know, we don't see crimes anymore. You know, we've, we've obviously, there's frauds and mail thefts and so forth, but the chance you'll be robbed, physically robbed, is very small. We still have an armed robbery squad, so we're still set in some really old models. Um, but, but the good news is, in that, apart from all that doom, is um, there's a lot of discussion about the issue. I had a lengthy discussion with the commissioner in a forum recently about the whole problem. We still, they still say sometimes it's not a police issue, and I say with respect, when someone's been killed or they've been defrauded or they're sexually assaulted in their homes, it is our problem. Um, but it is also a human services <coughs> problem and as I said, when they're 65, 70 and they've suffered 50 years of abuse, there's been some breakdowns, some opportunities missed all the way along the line there. So innovation for us is probably looking at um, enhanced models within our current structures. Hmm. So there is actually a good news story there <coughs> in terms of actually introducing new ideas, even an organisation which you said is a large bureaucracy. You're still making some progress. Oh, there's pro uh, absolutely. And the progress yeah. I've seen is slow, but it's it's meaningful. And, and my colleague in the panel here is, um, is, has seen the benefits of, of it in place in the North Shore where I first set, it, set that up. So, mm. yeah, that's the, the, absolutely good news story. Yeah. And how does the New South Wales Police seek to empower local communities? Uh, I think it's about, um, from us, you know, we're, the new corporate plan, I've got it written down here, the words, is um, <laughs> we're, we're developing our capability, prevention, disruption and response. So that's the crime model. And we've, we've come to understand very clearly in the police that if someone's victimised, it's too late and it's expensive. So we're, we're, we've, you know, we've, we've got a new commissioner who's very forward thinking. You've probably seen Mr Fuller speak publicly. He's very engaging, very dynamic. And we're look, really trying to upend what we do things in a smart way in that getting in early, build the capability of our people to, to take on these issues, respond and prevent, because 
by the time someone's injured, victimised, um, it's too late. And that's putting pressure on the hospitals, it's putting pressure on the courts, it's putting pressure on the corrective services and juvenile justice. So uh, we're moving into that space. So this fits in very well with that because we need to engage early and move very early. And a lot of that's about empowering older people to make themselves heard. So my, well, I've done a lot of work with, with the medical profession as a as an advisor and uh, legal profession as well. And it's about letting them speak up on behalf of the older person. When someone, when a patient comes into hospital and they're evidently unwell through some other person's involvement, speak to the patient. Don't speak to the person who's brought them in who's most likely the abuser. Why do we, and I say to police as well, why do we take the history from the person who's most likely caused the harm? You know, we, we don't go to a bank and say to the bank robbery victim, uh, you know, say to the, uh, sorry, the bank to the bank robber, what happened to the victim? You know, we, we clearly go to the victim, get their statement, get their evidence, and we prosecute the offender. But this, in the older people, it seems to be reversed. Mm. So we need to really empower communities to assert their rights as victims and as sufferers and, and, and accept the fact that they're the ones that have been wronged. They're not in the wrong. And some of them feel guilty because their child, who they raised, to have certain values, as, as I touched in that video, um, are behaving in such an abhorrent manner towards them now, they have a big problem in acknowledging that themselves. Mm -hmm. But we need to support them when they do that. So we need to have the, the health profession. When, someone, when, a, when an older person is taken to triage because they're so badly hurt, the offender can't hide them at home anymore, they've got to get them help before they die. And the nurse invariably will take the history from the younger person. Yeah. You know, and that's just the habits, and it's, 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 it's what we do. You know, in, the, in the financial, as, as, um, as the former Premier said before Anna Bly, you know, the, the banks will know something's going on, but, but the older, younger person walks the older person in and then they take the transaction from the older person and the younger person standing beside them with a metaphorical stick. So again, we've got to empower older people to do that. And, and there's some good signs coming. You know, the, I think the Me Too movement is something that's going to help us in this because a lot of the uh, victims, of, unfortunately, are, are female. And, and I use this in public talk saying, well, if, if people of power in Hollywood can be so horribly sexually abused and, and intimidated and... and um, and disenfranchised, what hope does someone, some old lady in Punchbowl have? Mm -hmm. um, but if these conversations are being had and we're accepting now that this is no good, um, I think this is something that we've all got to embrace as a government to support the people that come to us for help and the people that also provide service on our behalf to those older people who need help. Mm. Good. Thank you. Could I invite you now to give the microphone to uh, Rodney Lewis? who's the senior solicitor at Elder Law. Rodney Lewis uh, has had a long career in the legal profession, advising a number of governments here and overseas, and has produced an Elder Law proposal. Being a lawyer, it runs to over 50 pages, very detailed. Uh, so Rodney has been, and he's also written the standard textbook in the subject as well. So happy to recommend uh, his textbook. So can I start off then, Rodney, by asking you the question, how can the legal system be more innovative in preventing elder abuse? Thanks very much, Keith. Um, well, first of all, when we talk about the legal system in this context, we're talking about uh, a two-part legal system. The first part is the parliament. The parliament of where we are here in New South Wales, let's, uh, let's call it the parliaments of New South Wales and the Commonwealth. Uh, they are populated by lawmakers and they pump out statutes. That is the business of the parliament. Um, and the second part to the legal system is the system that we have of superior courts. I use superior courts advisedly because most of the legal, inst the legal remedies that, that uh, we may have for elder abuse are um, only available in the superior courts. Um, now, it may interest you to know, but perhaps you already know, that um, there are no statutes in, within the Commonwealth or the states uh, which use the phrase elder abuse. So that's a starting point for a legal system and, and what, it, what remains for the legal system to do about elder abuse. Neither, for that matter, are there uh, many, if any, cases um, uh, which deal with or which have dealt with the phrase elder abuse. In fact, um, Recently, I put that to the test and I could still only find one case. It involved the High Court, that's a tick, but um, it was all about a doctor who um, had been disciplined in Victoria um, and elder abuse was a part of the issues uh, about his misconduct. Um, now, um, 
that leads me also to suggest to you that there is a disconnect in language in this area. I often have people who will come into my office and sit down and, and tell me, uh, or even over the telephone, um, a, 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 an inquiry uh, where they describe um, some, some uh, um, action, something that's happened to uh, a friend, a relative, um, and, uh, and then at the end of that they say, well, and, and, and that's elder abuse, uh, Mr Lewis, so, so we would like you to do something about that. And then I have to go about, if you'll forgive the phrase, disabusing them about what uh, they mean and what we as lawyers can do. There's a very large gap. Um, and, uh, and usually people don't understand that there is a, a, a big gap between what they think is an injustice which may have occurred to uh, somebody in their family and what can actually be achieved in, uh, within the legal system. Now, um, Keith, you talked about innovation. Um, uh, and I, I, I note that uh, uh, the minister herself this morning, uh, commendably, if I may say so, um, said that the community should be armed uh, in its response. Well, at the moment, uh, I would say we are not armed and we're certainly not armed adequately. Um, there's a, uh, there's a, uh, a need to bridge the divide between uh, what we're talking about, what we wish for, what we're working towards, which uh, is um, dealing with, properly addressing elder abuse, um, providing recourse to the victims. And that's where I find myself at the pointy end of elder abuse, uh, in, uh, often. Uh, we need to, uh, sorry, the legal system and, and needs to adopt the language of elder abuse. Um, that's actually the thesis of my, my paper, which Keith <laughs> kindly referred to, um, that uh, the legal system is quite disconnected from the, uh, from the language of the people whom they serve or should be serving. Uh, and uh, so being innovative, well, my, my suggestion is one that is staring us all in the face. We don't drive on roads that are unregulated when we are a driver. We don't conduct ourselves in society um, as we please. There are rules and moreover there are consequences. So uh, my, the thesis of my paper, and I've thought about it for years, is that we need a national cooperative law. That's arming the community. And that's how I suggest um, that we may be able to prevent, and if not prevent, then deal adequately for the victim, elder abuse. Good. Thanks very much indeed, Rodney. And I might just say this is a document that's before the International Commission of Jurors and also have been led, read by the Minister as well. So we look forward in this document in some form or other going to the state government and perhaps involving other state governments as well. Clearly, from what the Minister is saying, there's a real appetite for the work that you're doing. You've been a voice in the wilderness, but now we've caught up with you, Rodney. Well done. Could I invite you now to give the microphone across to Barbara? So Barbara O'Neill <coughs> is the Aboriginal support worker, Junction Neighbourhood Centre at Maroubra here in Sydney. Barbara is a Dungati woman born on the Kadakal country of the Yora Nation. She is currently working as uh, an Aboriginal support worker at the Maroubra Centre, to which I've referred, and Barbara has worked for many years with Aboriginal communities. So, Barbara, may I ask you, what does innovation mean for Indigenous peoples in the context of the abuse of older persons? It means that we are different. Um, you are with all respect, the dominant society. We are the colonised. You cannot walk, work with us until you accept that and understand that. We can't change the colonisation. We can't change what happened. But we can put a line in the sand and move forward and try and manage the pain that came from colonisation. So to be to re recognise a, an innovation with working with an Aboriginal community on this very sad 
subject that we're talking about, we recognise within the community, I've spoken to many older people and they say when it's older abuse, because as the um, Commissioner said, or Commander said, <laughs> Commander. <laughs> Just go here. Uh, co commander. <laughs> as the Commander said, we elders, our elders have been abused since colonisation because they were disconnected from culture and from country. So we know what elder abuse is, but today we're talking about older abuse. When I talk to older people, their concern is, I'm not going to the police. Um, I can't put in my kids. I can't, I don't want to bring that trouble to the rest of my extended family. But the saddest thing is they accept it as part of colonisation. They go, well, that's what the wife fella's done to us. That's what's happened. So this is the hard, this is what we need to address. We will address this issue within our own communities, but we need you with your expertise to give us your research, give us your expertise, but do not but leave it with us. Be the structure around us. Structure, you be the scaffolding around us. Um, you, if you, once it'll be just more white experts coming in to deal with an Aboriginal problem. And you very well respected, especially community legal centres, come from a very good base. But the thing is you can't go in, don't take your brand in. Come in and work with us knowing that you're not going to be able to put your brand up or say, oh, you're our agency did this, isn't it great? We work unbranded in the Aboriginal community. We are not an Aboriginal organisation. So we work totally unbranded when we're in the Aboriginal community. Um, so an innovation would be for services to come in and be the scaffolding, be the anonymous experts. We'll know who you are. Maybe your funders, well, you'll have to let your funders know, but maybe the general population won't know that you're there, but we will. And that, and that is acceptance and entering our community. Good. How do Indigenous people seek to empower local communities to deal with the problem of the abuse of older persons? We don't have any power to give anyone else empowerment. <laughs> However, yeah. we... One of the best things, one of the biggest innovations that I can suggest is when you go in, especially to the Minister, when you work with an Aboriginal community, the, the power base that is already there is not necessarily the one the people can work with. Uh, the, you'll have land councils and land councils do fabulous jobs, but there are people within those communities who may not connect with the land council for various reasons, could be historical, could be family reasons. You need to connect, a, a really good innovation would be for those with power and influence to connect with a local organisation, Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, but always look for the Aboriginal one first. Go in, connect with an organisation that's on the ground and knows what's going on. And then, then, ver then let that organisation bring you to the table with people that they know are on the ground and want to make improvement and change. One of, I'm working with some women at the moment and it's, they have the most fabulous ideas, these older women. They have the best ideas but they've got no resources. They don't want to ask for resources because they feel like Aboriginal people asking for stuff again. They're not asking for money. They are asking for resources, an office space, um, printing, um, uh, support in getting their message out, um, some money to put on, just money to put on a morning tea. That's all they ask. And these, these women, what they want to do is go be in their community and st they can see the problems in their community. We are talking about elder abuse today, but they need to fix up the problems that lead to the elder abuse. And so these women know what to do and how to do it. So a fabulous innovation for empowerment would be be that scaffolding around them. So your suggestion then is that outside organisations could provide you with office space, printing, a bit of cash for morning teas, etc. Yes, or in kind. Um, for instance, local, sometimes I'll approach a local organisation and see if we can get in kind support. Yeah. Um, but 
they must lead it. They must lead it and be the name that's fronting it. Not yep. No one else is branding because the community will not trust them. Mm. So there's a question, therefore, of how do you man uh, bring those women together with potential assistance? So that's the... So will they go forward? Is there a, a network that they could approach and say we need money for a morning tea or we want you to provide an office space for a... Okay, so what... It's up to the organise the local organisation or... The, okay, suppose Seniors Rights and Advice wanted to get involved in a community. They would come to either an Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal local organisation and the, you would go to the Aboriginal organisation first and then talk to them. Say, look, we need to partner with you. This is what we want to do. How do we do it? Then we go to the Aboriginal community and say, look, these fellows have just approached us. How can we... We want... You know, we're here. Here's an opportunity. What do you want to do? Always ask them what they want to do and how they want to use it. Yeah. Good. Because I think that given what's gone on in, in recent years, we've moved from the stage of of raising awareness, although I agree you had to raise the awareness of, uh, uh, you know, Radio uh, 2GB's uh, <laughs> Alan Jones. But we're moving across now, I think, increasingly into implementation. So we heard that from the commander. We've got ideas now from Rodney. So we're also now looking for those ways of networking, I think, with Indigenous communities and Torres Strait Islander communities mm. to make sure that we can provide that service which is in, uh, so necessary. That service will happen if the right procedures, the right, um, the right cultural approach is taken. Mm. Um, most of you have probably got a reconciliation action plan. Make it a working, living reconciliation action plan. Lose your power, give it away. That is what it, that's how you work. Yeah. We're not asking for money. We're asking for in-kind support. Excellent. If you'd like to hand the microphone along now to Terry Leolis, who's the project manager of the Ethnic Communities Council of New South Wales. By the way, I'm reading some of the biographies from a marvellous collection on the website that I encourage you to go to. This is all part of the kit that you've just seen. This is background material, which is of use in the discussion group. So I, I recommend this. It also includes biographies of some of our presenters as well. So Terry Leolis is the project designer and project manager for the innovative Speak My Language project with the Ethnic Communities Council of New South Wales. Terry has worked in the community care sector for more than two decades in various roles, including senior management and community development roles, working with youth, families, ageing, disability, and alongside new and emerging communities. So let me put the uh, question to you, Terry. What does innovation mean for ethnic or culturally and linguistically diverse communities in the context of the abuse of older persons? Thank you. My hardest problem here is, sorry about my voice, I'm getting it back now. Um, in three minutes, it's very hard to answer. But um, I think one of the things that we're looking at, particularly with Speak My Language, initially when we started the program, we consulted with over 370 consumers and we discussed the issue of elder abuse. And many of them said, look, we, d we don't bond, we don't understand, we don't relate to the word elder abuse. The definition of elder abuse in communities is incredibly vast. And just as it is as complex with the Aboriginal community, imagine the complexities of the different cultural groups that you get. And each cultural group has a different perception and view of how they see elder abuse. So for many of them, with our Speak My Language program, we don't actually call the subject elder abuse. We actually call it trust and when trust is broken and you are hurt and alone. And halfway through our conversations that we have with our communities, we define elder abuse and then have it in those contexts. Many other conversations that we have, the innovation is around having our communities talk about elder abuse in their own language on ethnic radio. Thank you, Minister, for mentioning that. <laughs> Because Ethnic Radio, and we partner with SBS and NEMBC, Ethnic Radio is one of the, the most strongest mediums and a growing um, attraction for our ethnic communities around being able to link back to their homeland, their culture, their language, their music. And the person at the other end, the host, is one of the most trusted voices that they listen to at the end of the day. 
Many of our elders are sitting at home, aren't engaged with community and society. It's that older person who's sitting at home alone, listening to the radio station, maybe hearing about wellness and about elder abuse for the very first time. And because they're not being watched or being judged by other people, they're sitting in their own little lounge room listening, they are able to relate to those stories. And the stories are told by consumers themselves. And there is, uh, uh, we've done a few podcasts now and, and recordings of talking about elder abuse. And when I give it to someone to listen to, they say, Terry, I can't remember what you said. And I can't remember what the expert said. But I remember that little lady talking to you where her voice quivered. And she said, I'm being abused. I need help. And that made me say, oh my goodness, I need to pick up the phone. So really innovation for us is putting our cowed communities in their own language, in their own context, under their own terms and telling their stories so that the next person who's listening to it can say, that sounds like me. A lot of speak my language and what we do is co-design needs to be really important here as well. And co-design needs to be with our cowed consumers. And we've been doing so much research and it's fantastic to see our, our minister funding that. Thank you very much. There was a, a research that was done recently in Jenny Bray Consulting um, together partnership with Senior Rights Service and the Elder Abuse Helpline in ECC New South Wales. And she consulted with so many people who are waiting to see what's happened with that research. And where have our stories gone? I think some of the most brilliant innovative ideas come from those people who are within a context of um, a, a situation where they are unable to see results, so they come up with their own ideas themselves. And I think we need to take it back to the communities and the ethnic communities of the ground have so many solutions, but we haven't actually implemented them or incorporated them in our design. So there needs to be a, bit of a, 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 a little bit of a relationship between that. One thing we were talking about just before we came up on the panel is whereabouts in the world are people ageing and ageing well? And where are our centurions and most of the people who are ageing over the age of 100? And there's a um, research that was conducted with um, partnership with National Geographic called Blue Zones. And there's certain places in the world where people, there's a large number of people leaving very well over the age of 100. There's four places in the world that they found. And what they found was, amongst all the wonderful things that they did that they found people aged well, was that elders were respected in those communities. Um, the Okinawans don't have a word for retirement. They actually say that to live with purpose. So I work and then I get to a point that I continue to live with purpose. What gets me up in the morning every day? And there's such a sense of community responsibility in these communities where they have people that are living older and living well. And that's where we find a lot of our communities are saying, I'm disengaged with community. And so we don't have a community approach to looking after our communities that look after our children and our elderly. So with our, as far as innovation is concerned, for us, it's around understanding the complexities within our ethnic communities, having more stories and more conversations and having them at the forefront of driving that I know there's um, a, a report being presented today in the Hunter Valley um, with, this, with the elder abuse prevention campaign that was held in Hunter initially. It's now being taken at a wider scale across New South Wales and the New South Wales maps and the maps are supporting that. And it's taking pictures and pi taking ideas, it's all it is, and taking it to our ethnic communities and saying, I'm not telling you this is elder abuse, I'm asking you, what do you think of this? And how would you resolve it? And they're the most empowering conversations and the solutions to what we're looking for are in those conversations. Mm -hmm. So I'd probably say co-design, bring your communities on for the ride um, and let them come up with the solutions themselves. Mm -hmm. The complexity is amazing with our communities. We are also needing to support those who are having those, those conversations. We have bilingual facilitators that we're training through our Speak My Language program. And only yesterday we were in Victoria and some of the workers were saying, I'm having these discussions around elder abuse with my communities. I'm, I'm taking the reins, I'm stepping forward. And then I go shopping and someone from my community stops me and says, how dare you embarrass our community by having these conversations on radio, exposing our weaknesses. And so we need to support, once we help people have these conversations, we need to have those parameters in place to help those people continue having those conversations because they end up becoming abused as well for opening up the discussion. 
So there's lots of complexities. I could talk for two hours about this, <laughs> as you can see. But the solution is um, engage with your ethnic communities, do it in language, and allow it to be defined in their terms. And how about the whole question of empowerment? Have you covered that, do you think, sufficiently? Or do you want to make a few more comments about empowerment as well in, within the local communities? There's no nothing more empowering than knowing that when you do speak up, that there are services there to help you. With some of our communities that we consulted with, they said, look, I'm happy to speak up, but there's consequences to me speaking up. Yeah. I may have to leave home. I don't have a home anymore because I've signed it over to my children when I came here. I don't have any more money. Where's my short amount of money that I'll be able to survive? So there's a housing issue. There's a safety issue. And for many of our communities, many of them are saying, I turn up to hospitals hoping that the hospital system will pick up that elder abuse is happening here. Mm. And they don't, take, they don't pick it up. Add the complexity of dementia or someone with those sort of complexities, how do they express that elder abuse is happening? So as far as empowerment is concerned, there are a lot of systemic issues we still need to look at before we can say to someone, take the leap of faith and we'll protect you. But do we have that safety net that once they take that, that jump, that they're going to actually be supported. Yeah. Just one more quick thing very quickly, there was one particular community group and we talked about elder abuse and we defined it. And they said, well look, we can't really speak up because when we were bringing up our children, we led them with such a stringent force about how they're gonna bring up their lives, what career they're gonna go into, that now it's role reversal. And now I don't have a choice because they're looking after me now. So I just have to accept that I'm appreciative that they're looking after me even though I don't have the choices I would like to have. Mm, interesting. So yeah. they're the complexities within working with ethnic communities. Absolutely. Yes, thanks very much indeed. If you'd like to hand the microphone across to, to Margaret. Um, so Margaret Duckett is the Senior Rights Service Board Member. Um, she's also uh, had a very distinguished career in the public service, including being the Director of the Office of Ageing and has also taught at McGill University in Canada. And if you go on to the Lane Cove Council, um, the website, they talk about age-friendly Lane Cove, which is an innovation recognised by uh, the United Nations. Uh, so the question then uh, for you, Margaret, is that Lane Cove Council has received international recognition for its innovative age-friendly work from the World Health Organisation, and you've been involved with this work. What are the lessons for us in terms of empowering communities in the context of elder abuse? <coughs> all, my, all my life, whatever role I've had, I would define myself as an activist. Um, and that continues now. Um, <coughs> four years ago, my, I've never be, really been involved in local government issues at all. It's not been my interest. Um, policy and change and in my interests. Um, <clears throat> and some four years ago, our council decided that it was going to look at ageing in the municipality and how it could be done as well as possible. <clears throat> and they did a very, very comprehensive um, consultations. So there were focus group questions on things, surveys, seeking submissions, attending public meetings, a whole range of things, extremely comprehensive. And we ended up with about two inches thick of recommendations for things that should be done just in our little local council area. Um, we ha the, the council then set up an age-friendly advisory committee with nine community representatives, a couple of the council um, older people, and um, we started out trying to reduce those two inches of recommendations to a coherent approach. Um, we're very happy because at, at the end of the three years in November last year, we, ha we had six only left over that had not been done, and all six we had progress on. Um, so it's been an amazing journey. The very first year was hard. We got hardly any traction, trying to get people interested, trying to get change within the council, let alone with other bodies, was difficult. 
but um, we had an excellent community services manager and she just plodded on. And one of the things she did was look up and see that the WHO has an age-friendly communities and cities program. And so we followed that and we successfully applied to be accredited as a WHO um, age-friendly community and we were very happy to get that. Um, I know Kiama in New South Wales is also uh, an, uh, accredited as a WHO age-friendly community. There's about 10 different councils to my knowledge that have elder abuse collaborative work in progress. Um, Kiama was one of the very first. It set up with a um, dementia friendly project and a legal rights project. And Lane Cove we're now moving into in this next three year plan of a dementia friendly project and elder abuse prevention. But that is because I hadn't made the connection and I'd asked at a public meeting of a gerontologist, what could we do to lessen elder abuse in our municipality? And she immediately referred me to Kayama because she had a mother who lived in Kayama and who was in the very early stages of dementia. And so she talked about how the work that Kayama had done had made an incredible difference to the way her mother could o operate within that area. Uh, bank tellers were no longer quite so stroppy when they were a bit slow. Uh, taxi drivers were always helpful and would often escort people to their doors. Um, the um, shop assistants in the uh, supermarket would help when there was a bit of confusion. It just made living so much easier and having that sort of dementia friendly focus then lessens elder abuse in the outside world because people can start to realise that, you know, they're not trying to make my life difficult. This is a stage of life um, and we need to work with it. Um, so as a, we're, Lane Cove Council has passed unanimously that we're going to address dementia friendly projects and elder abuse um, prevention the exact strategies we're going to use are still being discussed. We will be having an elder abuse collaborative, um, but there's lots of other things that we can try and put in place. And one of the things that is done is really raise the issue about older people generally, how to make life easier. You know, it's not only looking at the footpaths and making sure you don't trip over or the light on the footpath or all the rest. It's also the social isolation, it's support um, with general medical and, and uh, support services. It's a whole range of stuff. Um, and it's been fascinating seeing that change in a community I've lived in for nearly 40 years and it's been a big change over just a short period. And so I would commend people to talk to your local councils about setting up age-friendly advisory committees and starting to look at every aspect of life in your community for older people and how they can do it. It doesn't necessarily need lots of money. What it does need is some creativity and thought and empathy. Um, and hopefully most of us have that. Um, the other thing is that from local to global, um, we've talked about the role of Seniors' Rights Service with our statewide role, the National Elder Abuse Conference. I'm talking about my role at local council area. Russell and myself are attending, uh, at the end of July, the UN's Working Group on Ageing. Uh, and we're seeking permission to present our um, community strategy response from the national conference. Um, we think we're going to be successful. Um, and that's also then taking what's done at this state level to the global level and trying to influence the overall response. Uh, one of the issues I'm taking up on is that WHO has a separate 
report on elder abuse and ageing, but the whole issue of elder abuse is not incorporated in its template for making a, an area, a community or a city age friendly. So I'm in the middle of drafting a letter to them recommending that they add that to their age friendly thing. And that to me is part and parcel of what all of us need to do is look at all the opportunities we have and try and push them through. Thank you. Very good. For the benefit of the hundreds of thousands of people who are watching us on our <laughs> webinar, I should point out that Lane Cove is the lower North Shore of Sydney. Kiama is right on the bottom of the south coast of New South Wales, so quite a bit of geographical divergence. Um, it'll be interesting if we could have a list of all the ten local governments, associations. Don't necessarily do it now, but perhaps go onto the web. Now. All right, we'll read them out. Let's get in, let's yeah. see who's involved. Put your um, hand up if you get an honourable <laughs> mention. Uh, Inner West has their Elder Abuse Collaborative. I've mentioned... Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've mentioned Kayama. Hunter has an Elder Abuse Collaborative and has also done specific work with uh, culturally and linguistically diverse communities. Um, Blue Mountains, Randwick, uh, they've not only had their Elder Abuse Forums but also done specific work on mental health and older people. Uh, Shoalhaven, uh, Sutherland and uh, Port Macquarie and as I said Lane Cove and Northern Sydney are about to start doing things. And we're within the boundaries of the City of Sydney and they're not on that list. We should take it up with the Lord Mayor. So we get, we've got some really great ideas for implementation here this morning. We've got a few minutes left for question and answer. We might perhaps start by inviting questions to the Minister. I'm so grateful, Minister, that I know your mind is want to get you out to do all of your mental health obligations, but we'll perhaps invite questions before the Minister is spirited away to look after further obligations. Yes, sir, would you like to stand and I might repeat your... Oh, oh you're going to get... Sorry, Minister, we'll take it back. Yep. Right, if you'd like to give your name and organisation simply for identification purposes. Thank you very much. My name is Danny Barber. I'm a legal practitioner. Rodney will be interested in that. Uh, but, Minister, I've heard uh, Dr. Suda this morning um, ask you the question whether or not you'll be talking to the Minister for um, Education. And I've, I've also heard quite a lot about the relationship between children and the elders. Uh, uh, elders. Now, the question I'm asking today, I'm not gonna really going to ask you to, to talk to him. Are you going to try and convince him to try some, to put some in our education system for young children, a, a, a system whereby they can learn how to respect their elders, how to deal with their elders, how to look at their elders and make it part of the curriculum like it is in some... Sorry, I don't know. Oh. Like it is in other countries where children grow up to have that part of their normal life and it is had to be part of the curriculum at an early age to do that. Hmm. Minister, sorry, we better have sorry. a mic. Good. Thank you, Minister. Thank you. Thank you, Tony Barber. Um, you're not the Tony Barber that comes to mind when I hear that name, but <laughs> it's lovely to meet another Tony Barber. Uh, yeah, no, as, uh, as, our, um, as Keith has uh, asked me, I have acknowledged that I will take up um, that opportunity to speak with the Minister for Education about what opportunities um, are available in the curriculum to begin to enhance and strengthen that awareness and that education. Uh, I think what's interesting is the, the Australian culture um, itself is intrinsically challenged because we are a culture that is very much proud of our individualism and standing on our own two feet and not wanting to be told what to do by older people and this sort of very independence, there's a streak within our culture and and while in some respects that's really good and that's essential because that drives change and, and, and forward thinking and, and new ideas, but concurrently though, 
we need to acknowledge that we are part of a wider community of all ages and stages and each stage ought to be respected. Um, so I very much um, are open to looking at how we can um, include that in the curriculum. And if you have examples of other jurisdictions that do that well, I'm more than happy to receive that advice from you. Uh, you can Google my name. All my details are on the web. So just send through links, it'll be great. Well, that's a challenge, Tony. Get your material. Lady at the back there, yes, ma'am. Name and organisation. Yeah. I'm Virginia Dougal from Asha Australia Foundation, which is a non-profit voluntary community organisation, and we're looking at Indian subcontinent. Uh, it's a question to the minister. It's lovely to see all the innovation and great and and to hear that and everybody spoke very well but the concern we bring and as a organization is we deal with the people who have language problems w with those elders which has got cultural barriers which have a face we do have a face we don't want to share our personal um, problems with anyone even to the walls and to think of talking to a 1800 number is is a no-no there is a stigma attached because we see a lot of people as a voluntary organization who have come here and who have left their homes, they have sold their properties, they have given to their children, and they have no means, and now they are staying with them, and there is a lot of abuse. Now, we were the only organization who put in the parliamentary inquiry at the end of 2015 in the elder abuse submission as well, which was accepted. And now we are trying to, we had a forum last week with the Senior Rights and Elder Abuse Health Line. But what we feel is that how do you manage to reach those people, those core people, innovation for them because they don't speak English. They have cultural barriers, they have mobility barriers, they are scared that we talk about our children, where will we go? Who's going to support and what are people going to talk? Now, we want to do that work, but we are at a place we don't know where to go because we have no resources. Our hands are tied. It's like today reminded me of that little cartoon I saw. There is a tree there. There's an elephant and a bird, and everybody says, go on the top. We are that elephant who do not have those wings to go up, to reach up to that innovation. Can you give us the answer, please? Sure. Well, I, th I think we've heard um, some contribution from the um, Ethnic Communities Council in, in how they are reaching um, the, the called communities and, and their innovation in that area. And, and uh, you know, we, we've chatted, you know, Mary's in the room as well, you know, we've chatted in, in recent times about the work that they're doing and the innovation that they have. So perhaps um, you could be connected up, uh, if, if not uh, be connected up with this advocacy group right here that is working all the time within our called communities and, and helping them come along with us in this, this journey we're talking about today. But there are other challenges that the called community also experience. So let's get that connectivity happening. And, um, and again, this is about working together. Um, I, I don't have all the answers. Uh, I don't have all the solutions to tackling this issue. And that's why we are all here together working as one towards that common objective. So let's get the connectivity happening and um, thank you for approaching me earlier as well. Thank you very much, Minister. Yes, you're going to have to slip away. So um, we're very grateful the Minister has been able to spend so much time with us this morning. Would you please join me in thanking the Minister for her marvellous presentation? And also for responding to the challenge from Tony about material to go to the uh, Department of Education. So Tony, make sure you provide that material. And others of us would like to see it as well, I think. Good. So thanks so much indeed, Minister. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. We've still got plenty of time now for the other panellists. So then there's a microphone that's roaming around for people if they want to put a question to any of the other panellists. I'd be interested, uh, I think it's... I'm just trying to think, Terry or, or Margaret came up with those five blue zones where you live over 100? Four blue zones. Four blue zones. What, what are the four? Well, one is Okinawa. You've already told us that. Oh, you, oh sorry. Oh. You, you need the microphone. <laughs> I've been talking too much. I'm losing my voice. Um, there's the, I'm trying to remember them now. Okinawa is the, the ground zero is they have such an incredible community approach to ageing and ageing well, um, where the elderly, the elder abuse is at 
incredibly low numbers and there's a huge community um, a responsibility to look after each other. Um, there's a, s a small island in Italy and I'm going to have to find out what that name is exactly and send it to you. Sorry, what was that? Sardinia, thank you very much. See, we're on to that, that's great. Um, Sardinia, Ikida, Ikida. Um, in Greece, a very small mountainous little range, uh, uh, an island in, in Greece. And a very unusual fourth place is in California. But it's a small community, faith-based community that is quite isolated, living in the mountains in, in California, that are also living um, in, in a way that is, again, a community approach to valuing their elders. And when it comes to teaching culture, it isn't saying you must learn this and you must respect it. It is, by, is profoundly in, in, engulfed into the community where you don't have to learn it. It's part of your DNA. If you have to teach someone respect, then it's very hard to teach it. But if you show them what respect is at a very young age, they are taught respect as they, uh, as they age. And I think just looking at education alone won't do it. We need a community approach. And having our elders, having their ikigai, having their purpose as to why they wake up every morning and having them um, involved with community more where they're seen as a valuable part of their community then actually teaches people that I am here and I, I need to be respected. One of the other programs that we did very, very quickly many years ago is we had young people involved in dementia programs. So we had year 10s who actually did a bit of work. They were petrified. Leading up to it, they were giving up lots of letters as to why they shouldn't do this work experience. <laughs> it's not for me. I don't like older people. I think they smell. And I had everything. And I said to them, no matter what, you're doing this workshop. They were with us for a year in the program. And when, we, when they left and they graduated, we said to them, okay, you've been with us for a whole year. What was the most in rewarding experience you had in the whole year that you did with us? They did all kinds of experience. And they said, working for a week or two in that dementia program has made me see elderly in a whole different light. And I would like to in, um, investigate working with aged care and community services. And these are young people who would never, ever consider looking at that sort of avenue. So it's around exposing them and letting them come up with their own ideas about how, the, how they feel about that. Except that, Terry, but I think having the imprints in children, and I'll give you a small example. It's almost 55 years ago when I was taught at school that when you wake up in the morning, you just don't say good morning. You say good morning, mum, good morning, dad. And 55 years later, I still remember that very, very well. And I'm trying to teach it to my children too. So it is, it is part. I do know that the two parts work together. Um, the elderly giving the experience and the education. But one without the other will both fail, I think, to a certain extent. The other thing is um, having our elderly in the schools to teach the cooking classes. Imagine <coughs> your, your hospitality classes are filled with learning to cook cultural food and hearing the stories of our elderly. So making them a part of the program where they have a, a respected role and that'll teach respect. Yeah. Inviting questions from the floor, but also I understand that we are inviting questions through the net, are we? Are people emailing questions into us? I've got that down on the running sheet. Perhaps we're not. No. If you're there, one of the hundreds of thousands, you've got questions. <laughs> Somehow you've got to communicate with Jane, to, so I'll be able to read out the question. While people are thinking, let me put a, a general question to all the panellists to answer from their own respective points of view. We've had a bit of an international focus just now on, on the four good places to live if you want to live for a long time. But I wonder, and, and the question I'll start off with will go to Margaret and we'll just work our way back. Margaret, when it comes to elder abuse, according to the World Health Organisation, how does Australia stand? Same sort of question for Terry with the, all of your connections overseas in terms of work with ethnic communities that might be in the United Kingdom or the United States, etc. How does Australia compare? 
for Barbara, the question obviously is, you know, making comparisons as far as you know with, we say, Inuit or the First Nations in the United States or the Ainu in Japan. Rodney, well, how is our legal situation, which is not very good, how does that compare? Are we that far behind the rest of the world? And then finally, Rob, comments about your experience with other police forces insofar as you may have had them. So let's get an international perspective, just a, a, a feel for how we are placed today when we know that our colleagues around the world are having the same sort of discussion. There, <coughs> there is no international best and worst list. Um, my feeling from talking to colleagues is that Australia is not top of the best, but it's not bottom of the worst. We're sort of semi-midway in terms of elder abuse. Um, but the position is changing as more and more elder abuse is reported and dealt with. And so I don't necessarily see it as enormously horrible if you start moving up the list of being a bad country in terms of elder abuse because it does mean you're acknowledging it and you're starting... One, the first step is to acknowledge it. Then the second step is to start putting the strategies in place to lessen it. Um, but you can't do the strategies if you don't first acknowledge it. And I do think Australia is now moving quite substantially in the last couple of years about increasing awareness about the issue of elder abuse and increasing understanding that it is everybody's problem to address. I think we're very fortunate to live in Australia and very comparative to our um, multicultural Western countries such as Canada and, and the UK. I think Australia is very much open-minded to having these conversations. And ver I very much agree with you. Because we don't have the statistics and the data to say we have high levels of abuse because the reports aren't happening, doesn't mean that it's not happening. And so it's very hard for us to gauge what the response will be when the data itself doesn't help us at all. But I do know working, for example, with the Elder Abuse Helpline, we did a Seniors Week event a few uh, months ago. And um, it was a pop-up booth, a photo booth that we did with our seniors. And as people walked past, they looked at the booth and it said elder abuse. They went, oh, no, 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 keep walking. Oh, look, photo booth. And they jumped in. And so they forgot about the, 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 the challenge of it being elder abuse. After they finished their photo, they had to come up to me to get a bit of a raffle. They wouldn't stop talking about their views and about their ideas about elder abuse. So for us as a nation, I think we are starting to be very smart and innovative around how to have those conversations. It's around capturing that data now and sharing it nationally. What do we know about what goes on, say, in the United Kingdom or the United States, where <coughs> they also have ethnic communities, or Israel, again, very multicultural society? Incredibly multicultural. Yeah. So have you picked up in your conversations whether or not things are happening in those countries as well? Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the countries are coming up with great multicultural policies. <laughs> yeah. That's They're fabulous policies. Whether you walk through the streets of your country or your, your community and you're feeling those being implemented and the communities understand them, it's the two different things. Right. So as far as um, policies, yes, we are looking at what Canada is doing and we're looking at what the UK is doing and we, we're developing some great documents and they look fantastic. But it's around implementing them on the ground and getting our communities to understand them. And does that include elder abuse, though? That's what I'm trying to get at. Oh, M Margaret. I was going to pick up... Canada has been doing some very good, innovative programs, but they're all pilot bloody programs. Um, and they, they are not being uh, rolled out properly and they're uh, not sort of substantive and going for a couple of years, which is what you need. UK, I think, has two pilot programs and that's it. Um, America, of course, has nothing addressing their multicultural communities. Yeah, and I agree, I agree with you. We have a lot of defragmented programs that run for a very short period of time over a very small regional area. We need, If we're going to be serious about this, we need to roll out something nationally over a couple of years' time, yeah. pick up the trends, compare them, yeah. and then move forward. We've got great little programs that get funded, and then after a year, they're no longer funded. The community comes back to you and says... 
but you did such extensive consultation with me. I haven't heard from you. Uh, are you still there? So we feel as an organisation like the Ethnic Council, we kind of approach people and say, we'd like to consult with you, but we don't know if we'll be back. And that's a really terrible feeling when you have with your communities, where it's all about relationship building. Yep. That's a beat. I think it's your turn now. Yeah, I totally agree with that. Yeah. Um, okay, I don't know... You've caught me on the hop because I really don't know much. I mainly know about the struggle in the um, international communities. I've never seen anything stand out about an improvement with um, the elders. However, there is another side to me, which is Scottish and Irish. And I am connected with those communities. And those communities in the, there are a small communities in the north of Ireland and in Scotland that identify as Celts, indigenous to their countries. And they uh, definitely have quite good programs in which they, they're, they're um, support workers, aged care support workers, um, undergo quite um, rigorous training in, uh, towards the respect um, of their clients yep. and, um, and to be aware of elder abuse. Um, and it's that's the, those two communities who are indigenous. Just mm. they're white, but they're indigenous to their communities. They're Celts. They definitely are addressing it good. as thanks. part of their culture. Good, thanks, Rodney. Is there any country that's setting us a good example when it comes to using the law to combat abuse of older persons? Yes, I think so. Um, the United States is outstanding in that respect. I don't mean you know it's reached the heights. Um, it isn't best practice. But they've got 50 states and each of those states has a, an elder abuse law of some kind or another. How about that? <laughs> so um, we've got a long way to go. Um, as I uh, often tell clients, um, the law, the legal system in this country gives me uh, the tools of a carpenter and you are asking me to fix a computer. <laughs> That's how, I'm sorry, I mean I've had years and years of experience and, and um, in fact, I'm coming up for 50 years in, in a few months. <laughs> and elder law, I've been doing elder law for, I, g I guess, only for about 10 years or so. Um, and I am continually disappointed by the way the law doesn't work. Or if it works, it only works for millionaires. Good. Okay. I, I'm really sorry to have to tell you that. Maybe some of you have noticed it. That is why I think legal reform should be up there at the front of the march with all the others uh, who want real reform um, because I think that the legal system is capable of actually delivering. What do you do when somebody comes in uh, and says, my son has, I just found out my son has taken away my house. I don't own my house anymore. I don't know how he did it, but please help me get it back. Good. All the phone calls, all the come and have a cup of tea, aren't going to get that house back for that lady. And, and if she really wants it, really, really wants it, then of course she's going to have to spend a minimum of about oh, $100,000. So of course if she hasn't got a house, she probably hasn't got the money either. Uh, well, Rod, now I think we're better. Okay, so anyway, the that's lesson the short, is short story: United yep. States. Is United States. Thanks and very we much. We should be best practice. <laughs> Rob, yeah, echo that completely. Um, there's two two important factors: is that um, this is pan cultural, pan national, pan social. Um, we often bash us up, up in Australia. I think we're really bad at things. We're actually really, really normal. And I've done a lot of research on this, and and basically, indigenous communities, non-indigenous communities, wealthy communities, poor communities. Uh, English speaking communities, everything else, the issues are very, very similar. The pre prevalence is very, very similar. Although it's hidden, it's very hard to put a number on it. But the estimates across the world in many, many studies are very, very similar. And if there are any, any differences, they're higher. So we're, our, our numbers, we look at 6 to 10% as an estimate, and that seems to be pretty consistent. Um, some, some communities report rates as high as 28, 30% uh, of their older community being abused. Uh, Israel, def definitely. Um, you know, I've looked at case studies from South Korea, uh, from you know, Maori communities in New Zealand, from uh, First Nations in, in uh, Canada, different areas of the states. So it's very much a universal experience and um, I don't know why it's happening and, and I all do respect about discussion about bringing up children properly. These communities bring up the children properly and that still happens.
Mm. Um, so um, it's a tricky, tricky thing. And when we talk about four communities in the world that are going well, which means a lot aren't. Um, so we need to sort of really get that. Uh, jurisdictionally, yeah, absolutely, the United States have it in their books. Uh, I've, I've been very vocal about the need to, to proscribe this behaviour legally. We haven't got an offence of abuse of an older person. I think that you need to name something and say, that is wrong. And that will help my GDs guys, who are well-meaning, but they're my 22-year-olds on the counter, on the front counter of Castle Police Station at 2 o'clock in the morning. Um, it walks in with a nuanced, complex, interpersonal case of dysfunction, or um, this person's committed the offence of elder abuse. Oh, great, well, here's the, here's the fact sheet, which is pre-populated. Put the dates and times and everything else, the name of the victim, the offender. Off you go to court. We haven't got that. Yeah. Uh, Canada's very good. Canada's very active between the police force uh, and the different agencies. They also have legislation which helps them prosecute. Um, we had a matter which was fairly notorious in the hills where a lady was found mummified in her bed. She'd been there for six to th between four and six months, very hard to tell because she was so desiccated. Uh, and the daughter basically, the classic story, and I always, you know, always talk about this, the warning signs, the 45-year-old um, the son or daughter who's dysfunctional through um, divorce or drinking or alcohol or cops kicking him out of home because of AVOs, goes back and lives with mum. So most families have a couple of siblings, a couple of good ones and a dud. The dud gets the job to look after mum. <laughs> in this case, the dud was a daughter. She was a fantasist. She, uh, she made up boyfriends. She told lies at work about her, her wonderful life. She was a tragic, sad case. You know, again, this, this, I was talking before about dysfunction. She was dysfunction plus plus. Uh, drank a bottle of, um, you know, bottle of cheap pop every night and looked after mum and couldn't do it. Mum died. She closed the door, sprayed some Pebo and some, uh, some uh, Glen 20 and then started collecting the checks. Um, we could not prosecute her for any offence apart from you know, mis stealing the money out of the accounts because we couldn't draw a cl clear nexus between her abuse and the death of the mum. So you basically they've got to abuse to the point of death for us to take action under Section 44 of the New South Wales Crimes Act which is failing to provide necessities of life. In Canada, if she hadn't provided medication or gone to a doctor, she would have committed the offence because the sliding scale picks up that whole, that whole continuum. So um, I... I yelled at one blue in the face to change this law. Um, <laughs> the Law Reform Commission got both barrels from me and they ignored me. They acknowledged me, but they ignored me. Um, so it's very, very difficult. But look, I think uh, from a policing point of view, we're, we're as good as anybody, if not a bit better than most, uh, and we're trying our best, and I think we're definitely on the upward okay. curve. Thanks. Look, we're almost out of time, and we have uh, refreshments waiting for us, but I'll just deal with some of the questions that have come. Uh, I'll just use uh, first names. Angela asks, when I notify the elder abuse hotline, what happens to that report? Does someone then investigate the situation? I'm really enjoying the speakers. Thank you. Does anybody there want to speak on behalf of the... Who's... Ah, oh, yes. Can we get a microphone to you, ma'am? Yeah. Thanks very much. That's a good question. Um, we're not a reporting service. So there isn't mandatory reporting for people living in the community in New South Wales or Australia, in any jurisdiction. So when they call us, we provide information, support and referrals. So we have a conversation and find out what the older person needs and wants. Often we're not speaking to that older person. Only about 20% of our calls are from the older person experiencing abuse. So it's going to be a third party. So it's probably an adult son or daughter who's actually concerned about one of their um, brothers or sisters who's actually the alleged perpetrator. So we'll work with them to make an action plan, if you like, to actually address what's going on for mum or dad. Right. Yeah. Good. Um, another person has asked, uh, we've got so many now pouring in, we're not going to deal with all of them. Um, a person uh, couldn't see the first half and is asking, will this be uploaded? And of course it will be. So, um, so that's the reply to that question. Um, Nita asks, wondering how much does the breakdown of the family unit within our society impact on the incidence of elder abuse and the lack of affordable housing? Break down, yep, Rob, thank you. It's, it's huge. So as soon as you get uh, siblings fighting, um, you know, they're always looking to get what they can out of the relationship. Uh, marriage breakdowns, as I said before. Um, so it's an unintended consequence of good DV policing is that we, we're very active as police. We remove the offender from the situation. We give them violence orders to control their behavior. So they're displaced from home. Where do they go? They go back into the old, their old bedroom with mum. Mum might have lost dad, she might be on her own, the brothers and sisters go, great, someone's doing the job. They're angry, they've probably got other comorbidities such as drug and alcohol and everything else. They've lost their house and their kids and so it definitely impacts upon that. The uh, affordable housing is massive. The inheritance and patience, as we said, mum and dad bought the house for £6,000 in 1964, it's now worth you know, $2 million or plus, plus, plus. 
Um, and because of our health, improving healthcare standards, they're not conveniently dying. So <laughs> it's this impatience to inherit what they believe is theirs. It's also an inher inheritance conserva uh, conservation, where the older person needs some medical intervention. They might need uh, proper chairs, the house being fitted out, medications which are expensive. I'm not going to spend that money on mum and dad because they're going to die anyway, and I don't want to waste all that money on them. So that's definitely a big impact. Hmm. Um, hi, Rodney Lewis. This is from Nicole. What has changed in the past two years for services or recourse for the elderly who are experiencing abuse? We know there is an elder abuse hotline, but what is the next stage of services? Can the hotline workers refer an elder forward onto another service for help? So, so oh, can we, we, sorry, better go back, sorry, better. She started off asking the lawyer, but we're back on the hotline. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, we're a broad referral, serv referral service, so we can actually refer all of our callers um, based on that conversation that we have with them to different services, whether it be legal, whether it be police, whether it be an NGO like ECC, whether it be a community service, whether it be council, you name it, it's just about anywhere and it might be actually places that people haven't thought of in the past. So that's what we're there to do is really connect the dots and, and make sense for people. Good, thanks very much. Uh, question from Julie. Margaret, if we wanted to approach our local council to come up with an ageing strategy or ageing world strategy, whom would we approach? Uh, you'd start with the community services manager, uh, you know, or a title like that. Uh, but you'd also start lobbying each of the older people, <laughs> the councillors, who, whoever there is, um, most... Particularly, you start with your local ward because you're a vote for them. Um, and you start organising that. You talk to your neighbours and friends in the area and get a movement. So there's more of you asking for it and suggesting it. Good. Thank you. And another question. Uh, will it take a royal commission into elder abuse to get changes to legislation? So <laughs> no, of course it won't. Um, Uh, of course it won't. It won't take a Royal Commission. It takes everybody playing their part in uh, speaking to their local members or the, or the responsible ministers, telling them how important this issue is, telling them that, uh, that we need better laws. We need a focused law. Uh, that's, my, that's where I'm coming from. Um, but, uh, and the police need better tools uh, because they are at the very forefront. They, they go uh, knocking on the door at 2 a.m. 2 in the morning. So they've got to be given the right tools and they need to be nuanced. There needs to be a scale, not just that's, that's fraud and I'm afraid it doesn't come up to there. It's, there there's, got to, there, there's a gap. There is, there is a, a gap in our uh, legal responses which, which needs to be filled. It needs to be addressed urgently. Yeah. Yeah. So just, to, just to add that, we're discussing yesterday with uh, Ruth from Trustee and Guardian, and hopefully she's watching. Uh, there's a whole bunch of enablers and barriers in our legislative framework. So there's a whole bunch of times between the civil law, between the criminal law, uh, there's evident evidentiary provisions. So, for example, in domestic violence now, we can video record the complaint of a, of a sufferer, and so it's evidence in chief. So that evidence can then stand. If they're unable to give evidence or unwilling or whatever else, we have them at their time and giving us a nice, accurate, in their words account. I can't do that for an older person. So an older person sit down with a type statement, recall that evidence, be able to give that evidence in court in two, three, six months down the track, which they may not be able to cognitively. So if I could get that video recording at the time of the offence when it's fresh in their mind and it's cogent and it's, it's reliable and use that going forward, we could. So that's a change in, in some legislation and some regulations. But we, we have some good stuff and then it's countered by other stuff. So we need a whole of legal system, you'd agree, Rodney, reform, just to take away these barriers and enablers from an evidentiary procedural point of view to make the other th headline things work. Mm. Good, thanks very much. I'm, I'm sorry, we're really out of time now, so would you please join me in thanking our panellists for really great <laughs> responses. And, oh, and they're now going to get a non-fattening cake by the looks of it, and I invite Russell to close proceedings. Thanks, okay. Russell.
Um, thanks everybody for coming along. I very much appreciate um, everybody's attendance today. Um, so now we're going to break for a lunch um, and um, please feel free to chat to any of the staff here at Seniors Rights Service. If anybody wants to know more about our organisation, um, there's plenty of resources that we have around and that we can share with you. So thanks so much. Oh, and there's evaluation forms on your on your um, uh, chairs. Um, please fill them out and just leave them at the registration desk by the front. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.